Hey everyone and welcome back to the Ether Hub with another Magic the Gathering video. Today we're talking about the latest news out of Kaldheim, the plane set for the game's very next story. Kaldheim is a world that's been teased a lot in the past and we're finally seeing this snow covered Norse inspired world for ourselves, but what awaits us on those chilly peaks? What stories will be shared around a crowded hearth with a nice pint of mead? Stories in MTG, at least in a modern sense, always are driven by planeswalkers. They're the stars of the set and its story. So if you want to know the story of a plane and the expansion set on it, taking a look at the planeswalkers involved is a great first step. And today we learn just who those characters are going to be. With two brand new characters, there's certainly a lot of different personalities we'll contend with on Kaldheim, and some that many players weren't really expecting. Let's discuss everything we know about the new Planeswalkers in Kaldheim. Of course, if you're enjoying the content, show your love by leaving this video a quick like, subscribing, and taking that notification bell so you never miss out on a new video. If you want to see these videos early, alongside with some sweet signed loot, consider supporting us over on Patreon. You can check out that and other perks via the link in the description below. And now, back to the lore. This was a big news day for Keldheim, as the development and story teams officially introduced us to two brand new planeswalkers gracing us on this Nordic plane, and spoilers, neither are as Nordic as you'd think, at least aesthetically. Let's first take a look at a Keldheim foreigner making their first appearance in Magic, Nico Eris, the Mirrored Spear, title of my own design. Who is this planeswalker and what do we know about them? Well, as it turns out, Nico is another planeswalker from the world of Theros, joining the ranks of other great planeswalkers like Elspeth, Gideon, and Kallax. Keep Kallax in mind because he plays a minor role in Nico's story. And yes, before the comments explode, I know Elspeth isn't from Theros, but it's her adopted home where she did so much good. She was a true hero there, so I'm gonna count it. Like all characters in Theros, Nico grew up under the very present influence of the gods. Being a human, they tended to worship the sun god Heliod above all others. But their fate would drive them in a different direction, right into the alluring pageantry that comes with competition. At a fairly young age, Nico was told to have a great and promising future, one of great skill. They would become a champion of Therosian games, a javelineer who would never miss, a true competitor the likes of which the plane had ever seen. This oracle blessed Nico with this amazing future, one they would run away with, train hard to achieve, and achieve they did. Practicing religiously every day, throwing javelins of all sizes and quality, Nico excelled in their field. They were unmatched in the sport of javelin throwing, never losing a single competition. With so much fanfare and the glory of victory coursing through their very fate, it's no wonder why Nico would come to worship Eroes, the god of victory. This fate would be, for most, a dream. To live out your life as a celebrated combatant, a proven victor in the games, is something simply most would never experience. Still, Nico felt as if this life, this fate, wasn't their own. Ever since the Oracle foretold of this gift, all they did was compete without any real challenge. They began to doubt their own fate. Maybe they weren't as good as they believed, but rather their fate decided that they would win. Did they even need to train? Did they even need to try? What if this wasn't what they wanted? Perhaps Nico wished to be more than a sports figure. If they decided to make a change, would fate stand in the way? Theros is a world known for its selfless acts of heroism. Gideon Jorah is a shining example of that fact. But even lesser souls know what it means to be a hero. To protect the defenseless. To stand up against insurmountable odds. To prove their courage in the face of utter destruction. There is no sweeter sense of achievement than knowing that you stand up for something. But as a mere javelin competitor, that was something Nico felt was missing from their life. However, a hero always finds a way. Nico would change their fate no matter what. The Oracle said that Nico would never lose a competition, so Nico forced themselves to lose, directly challenging their destiny. Nico threw a match, thus denying their fate, which on Theros can have some very dire consequences. This happened during the time after the god Clothes was freed from the underworld and once again reigned her influence over the fates of the mortals on Theros. 
Clothis was more distracted by other, more major defiances to fate, such as Elspeth Terrell escaping from the underworld. However, that didn't mean she could cut loose other rebels, changing the fate of Theros, jeopardizing the balance of the plane. Even Nico's throw had to be dealt with. And so, Clothis sent out her minions to deal with Nico and others who dared to defy their fates, ensuring that no one on Theros would ever challenge the will of the gods. Nico encountered this agent of Clothies, who is still unknown at this point, but we assume they played a similar role to Kallax. Yes, Kallax is a planeswalker created by Clothies for the explicit purpose of tracking down Elspeth Terrell and bringing her back to the underworld. Kallax is a planeswalker because Elspeth is a planeswalker, and for fate to remain unchanged on Theros, Clothies needed an agent who can track Elspeth no matter where she traveled to, even if it was to another plane. A skill I assume will come in handy with another planeswalker in Nico. So maybe it wasn't Kallax who first approached Nico, however he would be needed for what was coming next. During their fight with the god's agent, the ordeal was enough to spark Nico's latent planeswalker spark, sending them spiraling through the blind eternity and landing on a frigid foreign land, which we know is Kaldheim. Yes, Kaldheim's story will take place as one of the first worlds visited by the young planeswalker Nico on their journey to understanding what this power truly means. They have just bucked against their fate, wanting to find their own destiny, challenging the norms of Theros in that pursuit. Nico wants to be a hero, but being a hero means different things to different people and places. What does it mean to be a hero on Keldheim? And is being a hero the destiny of Nico? That's Nico's origin story, one I'm sure will be expanded upon in the official story of Keldheim. It's actually interesting to see a new planeswalker sort of go through this hero's journey arc while still learning about what it means to be a planeswalker. It's been a while since we worked with, in a story sense, a greenhorn planeswalker, so it'll be interesting to see how that develops uh, over the course of Keldheim. Now, on to more personal matters, as we get into the characters themselves, you probably noticed I've been using a lot of general pronouns when describing this character. And that's because Nico is written specifically to be non-binary. I know, a lot of people who don't see that as significant and won't want to use those particular pronouns, but hey, this is how the character is written, so that's how I'm going to be addressing them. No need to get all controversial about it, like it, hate it, it's a fictional character and I'll be treating them as they were created. On a lighter note, we know that Nico will be a blue aligned planeswalker who will be the first in a while, at least in terms of being mono blue, one that focuses on being precise, practiced and quick rather than pure intelligence and knowledge. Think of Nico as a pure blue Narset rather than a Jace. And yes, I know Narset was mono blue in War of the Spark, but in general she's seen as multicolored, typically Jeskai. In terms of their unique ability as a planeswalker, they'll probably have some very spicy card abilities because Nico can create and even trap people within shards of glass. Yes, they can create shards of glass at various different sizes and shapes, typically making them in the dimensions of a javelin, their preferred weapon type, and throwing them at their opponents. It's like an endless source of projectiles for them. Now, this glass magic has a secondary and even more impressive attribute. Nico can use them to store the life force of a single target it hits outside of Nico themselves. So the first target hit by one of their glass javelins will actually be trapped within the glass for a certain amount of time. The duration of this binding spell depends on the strength of the opponent. Normal humans can be trapped within the glass, struggling for several minutes without them being able to escape. However, a powerful planeswalker, think Chandra Nalar level, may be able to shatter the spell within a matter of seconds. This spell has additional uses outside of trapping foes. Nico can also trap allies inside it as well, being able to easily and secretly transport them in tiny shards of glass when needed. They can also release the trapped victim on command, meaning they can place an ally inside a glass javelin, throw behind an enemy, and have their ally re-emerge in a flanking position behind the opponent, meaning that Nico's ability is not only powerful, but tactically versatile in a fight. So when we finally see Nico's Planeswalker card and their abilities are revealed, I would expect some blinking or even tapping aspect to those abilities. This character is all about control over power, using dexterity and clever play rather than pure intelligence and spell power to achieve victory, which I hope are shown in unique Planeswalker abilities. Next, let's move on to our first and only native planeswalker of Keldheim to be featured in this set. And if you were expecting a burly Nordic Viking, well, 
prepare to be disappointed. Keldheim's own homegrown planeswalker is an elf named Tyvar Kel. What is his story and how do Keldheim elves differ from those on other planes? We actually don't get too much in terms of Tyvar's origin story. We know that he's a member of one of the two major clans of elves that inhabit Kaldheim, two distinct people, the Wood Elves and the Shadow Elves, who have more recently been brought together under a single banner by King Harold, the older brother of Tyvar. And that's basically all we know of Tyvar's story specifically. We don't know yet when his spark ignited or if it will ignite over the course of Kaldheim's story. It's not specifically mentioned that Tyvar is a planeswalker during the story of the set, so I can easily see him starting off as just another elf, albeit a famous one, who eventually sees his spark ignite in the story. What about Tyvar's personality? As an elf, what sort of traits does he sort of incorporate into his character? Well, being the younger brother of a great and well-loved king who united a people for the first time, you can see how jealousy and resentment could take root. We've seen that sort of development in characters in the past. However, Tyvar isn't your normal character. He's anything but average. Rather than growing dark, treacherous thoughts, envious of his brother's success, Tyvar celebrates and is inspired by Harold's deeds. In fact, Tyvar sees them as an example, a challenge to always push for greatness, to never shy away from a challenge, and to bolster those around you for the betterment of all. He's literally the most mentally confident and, frankly, well-adjusted character I've ever seen in Magic the Gathering. He sees the positive in things that would almost always sour another character in Magic story. That being said, Tyvar has been known to be a bit uh, boastful about his success and accomplishments. He can fight with the best of them, possessing an impressive physique. Obviously, he is this set's beefcake, but also a skill in a unique form of magic which makes him a very tough opponent in any environment. Tyvar can transmute his body into different materials found around him. Anything he can touch, he can transform his skin into. It's a little bit more versatile than that though, but think of that as an example. He can cover his body in thorns, bark, turn it to stone, summon brambles under the feet of his opponents. So like I said, he can do a lot with this power. This transmutation isn't only limited to himself. He can buff his allies in the same exact way so long as they stay in close proximity to him. Luckily for all of Tyvar's apparent cockiness, he isn't a solo artist. He'll boast the success of his team along with singing his own praises. He believes that one success is the tide that raises all ships. And in that, if he can help a friend win, Tyvar will. Like I said, he's just so mentally well balanced and I'm very jealous. So we know he's a jolly cocky elf, but how do elves differ on Keldheim when compared to others throughout the multiverse? What is the Kaldheim elven culture like? The developers said that they built this unique elvish people based on classical depictions of ancient Norse culture and mythology, Vikings and the like. They sing of glory, combat, tell stories of great deeds of battle. This is why Tyvar is so unlike other elves, who are well-mannered, reserved, and stoic in a way. Tyvar bucks that fantasy cliché and is almost bullish in his adulations. But this fits with their specific culture, their more individualist culture, worrying about personal glory over that of the collective. Now, don't get me wrong, Kaldheim elves still care about their kin, but they're not above personal accomplishments either. Kaldheim elves also all share the same religion, the worship of what they describe as a world serpent, ripped straight from Norse mythology. On Kaldheim, this world serpent is named Koma, who is said to protect the world by wrapping it in its coil from the very cosmos. Every elf can be seen with this twin serpent fang tattoo on their bodies, or at least Tyvar has taken that extra step to show their dedication to this deity. And they also fight with enlonged daggers in a similar design, reminding each elf, wood and shadow alike, of the importance of Koma. Tyvar himself fights with a double-bladed sword, which is his homage to the Great Serpent. I no doubt believe we'll get so much more of these Nordic-inspired elves moving forward with Kaldheim, but right out of the gate, Tyvar seems to be a great indicator of this unique spin on a classic tribe in NTG. And that Vorthos army are the two new planeswalkers we're getting with Kaldheim. 
Of course, this is a very simple and quick overview of their stories and personalities, which we will certainly see built upon as we enter into the official lore season of Kaldheim. But with that, let me know your own thoughts of these new Planeswalkers in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the content, show your support by leaving us a like, subscribing, and ticking that notification bell. You can also support us over on Patreon, where you can get these videos early, receive free cards, and more. Consider supporting us on Patreon by following the link via the description below. In any case, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!